We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Internet Governance Forum Workshop on Multi-Stakeholder uh, Content Governance. Uh, my name is Farzan Abadi, and uh, today we are going to talk about what is this multi-stakeholder thing that we talk about um, in, when it comes to platform governance, especially. And in the past few years, we have seen the emergence of content governance initiatives that in one way or another are suspicious of being multi-stakeholder or they claim that they are uh, multi-stakeholder. Or, um, and when we debate this multi-stakeholder nature of the initiatives, we usually use the term in a broad and uh, and abstract way uh, uh, and applying it to the whole initiative and um, kind of like uh, we need to uh, be a little bit nuanced on uh, what, uh, how, what our expectations are as well from these multi-stakeholder initiatives. Uh, so uh, at this session, uh, we decided to uh, provide a uh, a draft framework uh, to consider uh, uh, how multi-stakeholder these initiatives, these content governance initiatives are. And we aim for this session to be more than just a uh, one-off uh, meeting, uh, IGF meeting. We want to have a continuous uh, dialogue about uh, the multi-stakeholderism in uh, content governance and how do we assess it and for which issues in multi-stakeholder uh, in content governance we can use this multi-stakeholder approach and uh, so uh, uh, first we uh, present the draft um, framework for uh, assessing multi-stakeholder content governance initiatives uh, by, uh, by uh, Milton uh, Muller. Uh, then we consider, uh, we, we will discuss three initiatives. Uh, one is Christchurch Call. Uh, Ellen is going to uh, cover that. And another is the Global Internet Forum to Counter uh, uh, Terrorism. Um, and, um, and then I will have the Facebook over, uh, over uh, and Erin is going to um, uh, address uh, the Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism and discuss that. And then we have the Facebook oversight board. And uh, after, uh, which is going to be covered by Rachel. Uh, after that, we are going to um, uh, hear some commentary from uh, Dia and uh, Courtney uh, about um, you know the shortcomings and the advantages of these uh, processes, and uh, perhaps uh, kind of op uh, open the uh, uh, conversation about what sort of principles, if any, we want to have uh, for these multi-stakeholder governance uh, uh, in, in initiatives uh, when it comes to content governance. Okay, so uh, without further ado, Milton, go ahead, please. Um, we're getting feeling. If, do you have your, if, try to mute your computer. Yeah, I'm trying to get out of that. Okay, so. Yeah, it is muted. So, um, you will see the slides. Let me just um, try to go into. Um, well, so yes, we were concerned with the question of, you know, if people are claiming um, that they're doing multi-stakeholder governance, so what exactly does that mean? And um, how uh, does it actually distribute a decision-making power? How, how, who participates? Those are all kinds of issues. We just tried to create a framework 
uh, that would allow us to kind of in a step-by-step -step way go through uh, some of these issues and uh, really get a, a more accurate bead on what these initiatives are actually doing. How are they actually incorporating uh, different stakeholders? So uh, let's start here with the um, three basic classification criteria that we set up. They are authority, membership, and funding. Um, and we'll go through those one by one. So with respect to authority, and this is in some ways the most important uh, element, uh, how much decision-making power actually does this entity, this multi-stakeholder entity have? So for example, uh, let's say in the ICANN generic name supporting organization, uh, which is organized as a multi-stakeholder body, uh, they really do um, make decisions. They are the policy-making organ for certain aspects of domain names. Um, on the other hand, many uh, multi-stakeholder bodies are purely consultative. So you are essentially in, a, in an advisory role uh, with the group and you're not really having direct authority over decisions. And finally, there's kind of a muddle middle ground here in which uh, sometimes these advisory bodies take on uh, a somewhat influential role in decision making, even if they don't formally have direct authority. Uh, and uh, so, so we've, we've carved out a third space there. So this is one of our classification criteria for uh, these multi-stakeholder bodies. The other critical one is membership. Um, and that it means essentially, you know, who is included and how are they included in these processes? So we've had to break that down into two basic elements. One of them is representation and the other is selection. So by representation, we mean, has this multi-stakeholder body set up a formal, well-defined structure and possibly a balanced or unbalanced structure for representation, or is it simply, uh, you know, kind of catch as catch can? So, for example, you might create a multi stakeholder body uh, that says we're going to have 10 members of civil society, we're going to have five people from the private sector, we're going to have five people from government. Uh, that would be an example of a structured uh, representation. And anything that does not have such a formal structure, we're throwing into the, the B category, no structure. And then once you have a, or don't have a representational structure, then the question is, how are people selected to serve on these multi-stakeholder bodies? Uh, one, it could be completely open. And we use as an example of that, uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force working groups where you can just jump in. Uh, they may ignore you, but uh, you can all participate. Um, another is sort of a bottom-up selection process where, and, and this tends to work better with a structured representation. So you say, okay, we have um, a representative of human rights organizations. So uh, the human rights organizations organize themselves and they select their representative into uh, the structure. A third possibility is that the bottom-up process nominates people and this is typical of the UN and typical of the IGF in particular, the civil society may nominate people, put people forward uh, through some organized or individualized process. Uh, and then the top down process will say, well, okay, we've got your nominees and we're gonna select the following six people or whatever. So that's kind of a, again, a gray area in which there is some, bottom up and some top down. And finally, there's just a pure top down selection process where, uh, and again, some of these United Nations, um, what do they call them? High level um, uh, groups uh, are, you know, they just select people um, that they think are important or representative um, and there's no nomination or bottom up selection process. So that's how we classify things. There's actually eight different options here. And um, uh, I think it's an important element of a multi-stakeholder body. Finally, there is uh, funding support. And this is also important. Um, it, in other words, if you've created a multi-stakeholder structure or representational process of some kind, 
Uh, do you support the infrastructure for people to interact? Do you support travel to meetings? Uh, do you provide staff support for various kinds of processes that the, the group has to go through? Or do you not? And obviously this is not entirely binary, but um, again, we're trying to come up with a basic classification scheme. So I don't wanna to get too Cartesian on you all, but uh, you could imagine a three-dimensional matrix in which you would locate um, different initiatives, uh, authority, membership, and funding. And, uh, but I think we don't wanna get that uh, sort of uh, pretentious in terms of how we can actually quantify this, the answer to this question of how multi-stakeholder is it. But in some cases you can see that you know, some entities would have more authority, a more bottom-up membership and more funding, and they would be on the upper right of that uh, graph and others would be in the lower left. So that's our basic framework. I am finished with that and uh, I'll turn it back over to Farzana. As as Thank can... you very much. And uh, so uh, based on uh, this uh, framework, uh, Ellen, I wanna um, come to you and ask you, how do you see, so you've been involved with uh, the Christchurch call uh, since its uh, inception in uh, 2019 and um, uh, like in both uh, capacity of civil society and now, as a part of the uh, New Zealand uh, government, how do you see uh, its evo uh, evolution and uh, uh, how multi-stakeholder are you? Of course, as Milton mentioned, this is, uh, we are not here to kind of say, oh, you are like more multi-stakeholder than others, uh, but we want to kind of understand the evolution, how you, um, how you saw like uh, it went in the past and how you actually envision, envision a multi-stakeholder uh, future for uh, for Christchurch call. Can you hear me now? Yes, yay. I'm trying, seriously trying to unmute myself and being told off for it. Um, hello everyone um, from New Zealand. I'm Ellen Strickland and um, yeah, I've been um, a part of the Christchurch call process um, since the beginning. So uh, giving a little bit of background, but kind of try to tell the story in a way that helps add to this. Um, March 15, 2019 um, saw sort of unprecedented terrorist attacks here um, in New Zealand on the Islamic community in Christchurch. Um, and kind of recognizing the lives lost and the grief that was there. Part of what was unprecedented as well was the use of the internet um, in that terrorist and violent extremist content, um, which was uh, distributed in kind of ways that we hadn't seen before um, in terms of volume um, and reach. Um, and it was that moment, that use of the internet that um, brought uh, a, a need for some kind of response, I suppose. And um, that, sorry. Um, I have some notes I'm just trying to get to here. Um, sorry about that. Um, yeah, and, and so, you know, it, the Christchurch Call Initiative was about thinking about you know, how the outcomes that you want around dealing with terrorist and violent extremist content and how you would address that. And, and when those events unfolded, there were actually some, um, you know, national regulations, Australia, for example, and some others that sought to sort of take, um, you know, government action, national regulation. And the Christchurch call really came about um, from, you know, New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern thinking, you know, what, what response is needed here? And that really in order to understand the problem and to have a response that a national, this was, you know, an event that impacted people around the world and, um, and was so unprecedented and, and, you know, the systems that were in place then weren't working. Um, what do we do about it? And it was something that would require more than just creating some quick regulation. And so, you know, between New Zealand and France, there was quickly this idea of an initiative that would be a range of countries and the social media companies, that particularly those that were most uh, dealing with, with the incident. Um, and from that inception, that idea that they would draft a call to action, it wouldn't be a treaty, 
but it would be kind of a, an action oriented agreement about things that they would do together, talking about it that, um, you know, I was um, I'm part of Internet NZ, which is the CCPLD and um, working kind of as a civil society part and the internet, but that the prime minister, when they first announced it, you know, on, on the television said, and, you know, we need to be talking to researchers and civil society as well, because this is about understanding what's happening and taking action. And so from that point, you know, there was a behind the scenes kind of negotiation of this call to action document, but there was also a mobilization of researchers and civil society and advocates to, um, you know, try to understand what was going on in this in this call to action, this agreement that was happening. And so I think it's, you know, important to recognize that, you know, there were elements of that understanding that to get outcomes on harmful content, on this terrorist and violent extremist content, you needed the different parts, you needed the technical community, you needed research or civil society, um, you know, involved. But yet, at that beginning, it really was a kind of governments and companies and you know select self-selected or selecting themselves led by New Zealand and France um committing to I think it was 24 action items but some were for companies some were for countries some were you know for both and um and that really um you know it, the the role of civil society um was you know in, sort of grown through the actions of civil society so they did around it was a kind of big events in Paris to launch the call to action, but there was a side of it, civil society, they weren't at the table. Um, you know, so it's important to kind of recognize the roots of this came from that place where in civil society kind of, um, you know, asserting the, the importance of, of um, a multi-stakeholder approach and then caring about the same outcomes, but that you wouldn't get the outcomes that we were saying we wanted um, with just companies and governments really. Um, and so I think, you know, then, so that was two years ago, over two years ago. And uh, during, since then, um, there's been the creation of a civil society advisory network formally to be kind of a part of the Christchurch Paul community. Um, there has been a second summit two years afterwards. And, um, and actually before that, to go back, there've been just some inclusions that started to develop of civil society being a bit more included. So. In September that year, 2019, there was a follow-up meeting in the UN General Assembly, um, and a lot of work was done to get civil society more involved, to have representatives there um, and supported to be there, to give them speaking slots. And I think that's kind of led to May this year, where we had a summit, um, the two-year anniversary summit, um, which was much more of a, you know, the community coming together with an advisory network to talk. Um, but I mean, I think I, I sort of say, you know, it's that progress that I think is interesting and I reflect on it, it's about those outcomes and that it, it is, um, I think the criteria itself um, that you put forward, Milton, um, is, you know, interesting in that I think some of those things you posited are about how you deliver the outcome. So to reflect on the Christchurch call in your criteria, I, mean, it was, I think that you know, the authority one is one that you certainly don't see decision-making power there for other groups, that it is about, it's an action-oriented initiative. Um, and I think, you know, whether it's governance, um, I think that a really important thing I'd love to tease out more is that idea of the middle ground and the idea of influence, because I've been involved in ICANN and other spaces, and I think there are times you can have authority and, um, and not have, like, influence or that the authority doesn't make for the best outcomes because you end up in a battle of authorities of different groups. Um, I think I can as an example of that. And that, uh, you know, what I would like to see is authority in, within multi-stakeholder processes, but also in a system that allows influence of the groups of each other up to the point of authority so that the outcomes that you're deciding on are influenced by each other as well, rather than a kind of, you know, map sort of different authorities battling each other. Um, and I guess just to say, you know, with membership, I, I really, I can see a lot of what you've done there for, for the Christchurch call. Um, it, it is become more structured over time. I think the selection process also mirrors some of what you're saying in that initially it was very much self-selected or top-down selected. 
and that for the Christchurch Paul um, community, there's become an awareness, especially with the um, advisory network, that there needs to be transparency. First of all, so that would be something I would add there that, you know, that idea of transparency in, in the membership is fundamental, but often lacking in these things in that top down way. Um, but that, you know, we're now in a process to have a community process that's more bottom up, transparent, has input from all the community about who joins in each of the areas and how they work together. And funding, lastly, I think is just super important. It's been an ongoing thing in the Christchurch call from the very beginning, you know, inviting civil society, other groups that don't have funding to come to Paris, but are you supporting them to be there, you know, to engage? Are you supporting the network across has been something that um, has been a process for the, for the, you know, where now there has been funding found, for example, to help support the advisory network. But I think it is all that in the right direction that you're, but the framework that you've put there to me resonates in those ways that I see with a focus on the Christchurch call on the outcome, on how do we work on terrorist and violent extremist content and minimizing you know, that together, that some of the things you've put here, we've found moving in those directions to enable the work of you know, a multi-stakeholder engagement. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Ellen. So um, it seems like uh, nominal authority might not be a very <laughs> very effective uh, way of doing uh, multi stakeholder uh, processes as well. And I'm 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 making very bold conclusions. It's like you know it's at five forty a.m. here, so if I don't do that, I might fall asleep. So <laughs> uh, take it with a grain of salt. But um, uh, well. Uh, during the uh, Christchurch call and when the New Zealand and uh, France government uh, were deciding uh, what to do uh, with this initiative and how to go about it, and uh, uh, fortunately they also like took uh, into consideration to give it a multi-stakeholder uh, angle, there was another uh, uh, organization that had um, it was launched uh, before uh, the Christchurch call by, uh, by the industry, and it was called the uh, Global Internet uh, Forum to uh, Counter Terrorism. And uh, after the uh, Christchurch call uh, uh, was uh, convened, and uh, I might not be uh, very uh, accurate here, so Aaron, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, a gift city became um, uh, like an NGO that a not-for-profit organization that and also the multi-stakeholder angle of the processes of uh, Give City um, were um, strengthened or uh, Give City aims to uh, uh, to focus on that part as well. So Erin, uh, now I uh, come to you and ask you, uh, where do you see this multi-stakeholder? I mean, when we talk about multi-stakeholder initiatives, uh, you might have uh, multi-stakeholder processes in one part of the organization. And uh, so tell us a little bit uh, uh, about the uh, Give City and how you go about multi-stakeholderism there. Sure, well, thanks again for having us and everyone's across different time zones and in different areas and some of you in person, uh, but it's always just good to convene in this sort of forum because a lot of times Maybe these are some of the dialogues that we don't get as proactively from some of the other forums we participate in. Um, I was, it was great seeing the matrix. It's like we're gamifying multi-stakeholderism and maybe that's not a bad way to go about it. If you gamify something, we're always nowhere to plot ourselves better on that course forward. I mean, for anyone dialed in that hasn't heard of GIFCT or the Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism, we are a little bit of a of a unique origin story in that it really was a very particular moment when we were founded originally as an initiative run by tech companies for tech companies. So launched in 2017, founded by Facebook, Microsoft, YouTube, and Twitter, bringing together a group of tech companies, and it was run multilaterally by tech companies. At that point in time, you could say that multi-stakeholderism was convened mostly in a consultative realm and also to help decide what some useful output and tools online for civil society would be. If you look at 2017, which feels like in online terms a million years ago, uh, this is a moment in time where you saw lots of 
very honestly, lots of ISIS content or Daesh content all around the world. And there was a lot of news hype around foreign terrorist fighters. And you saw on mainstream social media platforms, uh, just tons of open, overt membership and sympathy and uh, selfies. And this is what convened the tech companies to say, okay, we can't just do it one off. Each app is we're seeing this migration between platforms. And so when GIFCT was formed, it was really with three primary questions in mind. It was questioning where can you share technology across platforms in a way that does not violate privacy and human rights concerns. Uh, and that is a very big question still to this day. Where can you get better action-oriented research from global experts that actually are solution-oriented? Because a lot of times as a former academic, you write a beautiful 100-page paper, nobody reads it, they read the <laughs> executive summary, and maybe the conclusion is just more research is needed. So we needed much quippier, fast results from global experts on what adversarial shifts look like. And then the third was really, how can we share knowledge between sectors better? So it was trying not to be tokenistic about when we go to civil society, it was actually saying civil society has their finger on the pulse of adversarial shifts in a different way to law enforcement and in a different way to tech companies. We are all seeing violent extremism and terrorism in a slightly different but really important way. Now, the big shift, as you mentioned, was after the horrific terrorist attacks, which were white supremacy terrorist attacks in Christchurch, New Zealand, as tech companies, there was that recognition of in the face of a real world crisis that has online threat components attached directly to the ongoing real world threat, how can you react as the tech community to that crisis? And obviously the Christchurch attacker video went viral at a speed, having looked at terrorist content for way too many years, it went more viral than any one piece of terrorist content I've ever seen in the fastest amount of time I've ever seen. So the idea of how do you do crisis response was really important. Um, and that also, as you mentioned, had the tech companies realize that this couldn't be multilaterally run as just an initiative. It really needed its own robust funding and it was transformed into a 501c3 NGO. Uh, so when we turned into an NGO, we had the question, how do we bring multi-stakeholderism by design into how GIFCT operates? And I wanna be very clear that for us, multi-stakeholderism has to have impact-based goals by design. So I always wanna say hours worked does not equate output necessarily, and output does not always equate impact. You have to actually decide what you want from that convening and build that into how you bring people in so that it's not tokenized. Um, one of the ways we iteratively brought that in was to, in our governance structure, we have an operating board that's made up of the founding four tech companies that fund us, but we also have an independent advisory committee that is made up of both government and intergovernmental entities, but that that number was proactively outnumbered by non-governmental NGOs, academics, and CSOs. Um, that's still an area that I think needs to evolve as it goes to make sure that that advisory committee has better structure, has better funding, has better infrastructure to make sure it actually advises us in a way that's implementable and actionable. It also has a chair that uh, is, has to be non-governmental in nature. Uh, and again, as soon as you say multi-stakeholderism, you cannot make the goal to agree. You cannot make the goal that everyone should all of a sudden agree on one thing because government, law enforcement, tech companies, human rights activists, security companies are never going to necessarily agree on the path forward. But for us, having that advisory committee, it's meant to raise all the various 360 degree concerns and have a global perspective so that when we do make a move forward, at least we have the alarm bells in the right places for why a step in this direction might be good here but bad here and understand those consequences. It does mean that sometimes things take a little longer to take that step forward, but it means that maybe it has a more solid foundation uh, and the risk mitigation is by design. When we say safety by design, I think some of this is also just how you design your programs and how you design your outputs. The other area that we really wanted to get a lot of feedback from a wide diverse range of perspectives is in our working group. So every year we re fresh five or six topics and convene people from around the world that meet once a month. And the point is to produce an output at the end of that year process with that group. 
Again, that's evolved. It's only the second year that that's existing. Uh, we have five topics. It's everything from crisis response to transparency to technical approaches or legal frameworks where we start seeing legislations in different countries start to contradict themselves even. Um, those working groups have about 170 plus participants uh, from 35 different countries. And again, you're not gonna get everyone agreeing on pathways forward. And I think you start realizing too, that when we say CSOs or civil society, that's not a homogenous voice whatsoever. And so an activist in France might have a very different opinion to an activist in Singapore or in Turkey, uh, and their concerns are all valid. So I think, again, the fact that those groups are producing output together and having to highlight the different perspectives has really helped us in concrete ways. Uh, concrete examples include, I would encourage people to go as bedtime reading and look at GCT transparency reports, really fun bedtime reading. <laughs> I know, I love giving people homework, but if you look at the 2020 versus the 2021 transparency report, our last transparency report is probably two to three times longer than the one the year before. And a lot of that came from feedback from our transparency working group that really called us out on areas that we needed to be more specific, more accurate, give more qualitative explanation about some of the data. And that's not done. That's not a box ticking exercise where you say, great, now go away. You say, okay, What's our homework for next year to make that even more robust? It's very rare for an NGO to have a transparency report, but because we have tooling that we manage that helps facilitate other tech companies to surface and review certain types of terrorist content under specific criteria, we feel we need to be more transparent as well. We also developed because of that, those working groups, a crisis response directory. So one of the feedbacks from Christchurch and other governments and law enforcement was in the case of a crisis, they don't know who to reach out at tech companies. They don't know the crisis hotline for a 24 hour email service from a tech company to make sure that that on the ground real world crisis is being dealt with if it has online aspects. So the crisis response working group helped us develop a protected directory so that in the case of real world harm, if relevant authorities reach out, they at least can be put in touch with the right point of contact at a given tech company. Um, any of these outputs for working groups, if a CSO individual leads on the output and helps develop the paper, we have funding behind that. So we also need to say, okay, it's one thing to dial in once a month to a meeting, but if you're taking more of your time, we shouldn't tokenize that time and we should put some funding behind it. Um, lastly, I guess a good example of some helpful feedback from the global community has been through our global network on extremism and technology, our academic wing. And just in the last year or so, they've produced over 190 insights, which are shorter blog form, finger on the pulse, adversarial shift write-ups. Those are funded as well, which is rare for researchers, even for short blog forms to get quippy funding, just micro grants. Um, and those insights have come from 245 authors from 25 different countries. Far-right extremism in Singapore looks really different to how it looks in America as examples, but also that network is allowed to question really broad violent extremist trends like 5G cell phone conspiracy theory and QAnon uh, migration or things like Hindu extremism in India or Buddhist extremism in Myanmar. And we need to also recognize that terrorism and violent extremism looks really different in parts of the world. So multi-stakeholderism to sum up has to be impact focused for us. We want to build in micro to macro grant funding to support CSO participation. Uh, I would say CSOs also have time constraints that maybe government and tech don't to participate. So we've tried to be horizontal in including things like Slack channels and joint documents so that if someone can't make a meeting because of their real world issues, that that's not punished. Um, and then we also were totally masochistic and carried out our own human rights impact assessment in the last year. And I'll share links to that, which kind of is helping us guide a very long laundry list of ways that as we go and evolve, we could get better. So it doesn't always make things easy to be multi-stakeholder by design, and it doesn't always make things faster, but I do think it gives you solid grounding to build from so that in the long term, you're not facing those issues five years later when you think, oh my gosh, I built this on shaky foundations. And so it's iterative, it's evolving, it's not always easy, but I think it's worthwhile in the long run. Great, thank you so much, Erin. And uh, so the next initiative that um, uh, you might have been surprised to see the name of Facebook Oversight Board in a 
multi-stakeholder uh, session. And this is what exactly we want to uh, find out. We want to uh, see if uh, we can, uh, in some way, frame uh, oversight board uh, as a multi-stakeholder uh, initiative. And the, um, or not. I mean, not everybody has to be multi-stakeholder. <laughs> and uh, also uh, the other um, a point that a Facebook oversight board is uh, different from the other uh, two initiatives uh, that it has a, a broader mandate. Um, the Christchurch call and uh, Give City, they work on uh, terrorist uh, extremist uh, content uh, while the uh, Facebook oversight board uh, works on uh, broader uh, content policy issues and uh, at Facebook and Instagram. Um, Meta is the bigger corporation, right? I don't have to. <laughs> so anyway, I'll go to you, Rachel. Please uh, tell us uh, about the oversight board and how you uh, frame it and how you can use the framework that uh, Milton presented uh, to uh, talk about the oversight. There we go. Uh, can you hear me? Good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, uh, I'm already learning a lot of a bunch of, of notes to talk about. So I'll just give sort of a quick two minute overview of what the board has done in our first year. And then I'll um, apply this multi stakeholder framework um, to some of the work that we're doing. So the board um, was started in, or the idea of the board was started in 2018 um, when Facebook realized that maybe they shouldn't be making all of the most difficult content moderation decisions on their platform um, on Facebook and Instagram by themselves. And so in 2018, they started a global consultation where they went around the world talking to experts and trying to figure out what would be uh, the best way to structure this group because I will admit, and, and I think every one of our board members still sees this as very much an experiment and a new um, type of institution. Um, and so back in May of 2020, we announced our first board, board members. We, and also discussed um, or made public the information about the trust that was used uh, to set up the oversight board. So um, Meta, back in 2020, put $130 million into this independent trust, um, appointed trustees who manage that money. Um, and I work for, and with that money, we created the oversight board. The board members are paid through that trust. I work for um, the oversight board, which is a part of that trust. Uh, Meta, anyone over there could not fire me. Um, I don't closely work with them on pretty much anything, um, but we, uh, so I would maintain that we're, we're quite independent and it's a, it's a unique structure. Um, so what have we done in one year? We started taking cases in our opening up for appeals. Users can, um, if you feel like your content was removed from Facebook or Instagram wrongly, or if you think content has been left up on Facebook or Instagram in violation of um, the community standards and community guidelines, um, you can appeal to the board. Uh, the board then selects a very small number of those cases to uh, dive in deeper, to look at that content moderation decision. Um, and then we have two parts to that case. We have a binding part, um, which goes a little bit towards the authority uh, part of the multi-stakeholder breakdown. We have a binding part that says uh, the board decides, yes, the content stays up. No, the content comes down or vice versa. It comes down or stays up. Um, and Facebook and Instagram must do, we say, on that binding piece. But the real, um, I think, lesson and, and meat of these decisions um, that we have been putting out are the recommendations. So we make policy recommendations to Meta um, in every single case, uh, whether on things like, um, you know, you should translate your community standards into Punjabi, uh, a language that over a hundred million of 
your users speak. Um, you should ensure that satire, there's an exception for satire and clearly explained in your cases, or sorry, in your community standards. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so we make these recommendations. Since the board started, we've issued 19 decisions. We just had two come out yesterday. Um, as part of those 19 decisions, we've made 75 recommendations. Um, Meta has agreed that has agreed and already implemented half of those uh, recommendations. There were four that they said absolutely we're not going to do, um, and then the rest they're still assessing. So um, trying to uh, figure out with their product teams and. and the content moderator teams and the policy teams, how they can make those other recommendations come to be. Um, so let me talk about how we are multi-stakeholder. Um, I think there are kind of two parts here. First, the board itself is pretty multi-stakeholder. Um, they were selected, the first four co-chairs were selected exclusively by Meta those four co-chairs then worked with Meta to select the other first 16 co-chairs. And they're people from all over the world. There is a representational aspect. Um, we have board members from each region um, and have set aside uh, special uh, slots for members from each region. We've also really looked for a diverse group of people, whether they're former federal judges to activists, civil society, academia, journalism, former prime minister. Um, and so really diverse group of people um, who then are the ones on the board. But I think uh, the board has also really tried to set up processes to ensure um, a more multi-stakeholder component of the case decisions too. Um, and I was really interested in learning more with Aaron about some of the micro grants and um, funding structure that you set up because right now we do, um, we have a couple pretty open processes for civil society. First, we set up a public comment portal. So every time we announce a new case, uh, we put a description of that case on our website. Um, and anyone from all over the world, and, and we really actually, you can be an expert, but just somebody with local contact, somebody who could say, hey, I'm talking to people on the ground, this is what they're seeing. Um, you don't need to have a, a law degree or any special education to like really write meaningful comments. And I, I say that we do receive a lot of meaningful comments in our case relating to former President Trump, we had 9,966 public comments, um, but on an average case, we get about between 25 and 50. Um, and within those 25, I would say there's always a good group of eight to 10 comments that really impact the board's thinking on decisions. And frequently we will put recommendations from civil society in particular directly into our policy recommendations. So things that civil society has been demanding of meta or facebook do for a long time frequently end up in our decisions um so that's our public comment process alongside that um my coworker holly and i run uh what we call office hours so every time we open a case we then make ourselves available uh for usually two hours that week one that is early in the morning my time like right now or one that's late so we can cover a lot of the world um, and then we also do roundtables, uh, but we, in our bylaws, must publish a really extensive annual report, an annual report. We plan to talk about all of the roundtables we've done, uh, all the stake, the multi-stakeholder engagement we've done, um, and try to be really transparent to give people a better sense of what the board is up to. Um, so I think sort of through that, I've covered our authority, which is the binding nature, as well as the policy recommendations, which Meta must respond to our public, our policy recommendations. Our membership, um, it's, it's top down, uh, but hopefully we've also got a bottom up um, with the public comments and office hours. Um, and then the funding issue, we talked a little bit about already um, i'm happy to answer more questions on that we also part of that funding is thinking when we're listening to milton 
um, we have Uh, I don't know. researchers uh, that we've commissioned to try more professionalized and academic research in those public comments. It's sort of uh, my overview. I'm really excited to answer questions and see all of you guys. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. And uh, so um, I'm going to uh, go to Dia and ask Dia. Um, so they, um, you have been involved with these uh, initiatives one way or another, um, and um, uh, and there are a lot of uh, talks about the uh, legitimacy of the uh, processes and when they use uh, the uh, multi-stakeholder uh, process, how do they actually like facilitate um, uh, how do they facilitate the participation of uh, civil society, especially? But also, like, how uh, how uh, how was your experience? What is your uh, perception of uh, all these processes that we actually um, put forward now? Great. Okay, I'm going to try to be brief, um, but I do want to respond to some of the points made by my fellow panelists up to this point. Um, really great overviews. And I, I should say I've been heavily involved in each of the three initiatives outlined here. Um, uh, each of them had really different starting points. Uh, so I think that they're, they're really helpful to look at uh, to sort of compare and contrast. But I do wanna start uh, with just one really essential point for, for civil society. Um, and very much in keeping with sort of how I try to participate in these things, I'm just gonna be you know, quite frank that there's always a danger of civil society being used as window dressing. I can't tell you how many times I've heard the phrase, we consulted civil society, um, and I've thought, well, what, what does that mean? Um, <laughs> And, and, and so really, uh, I think that when we talk about multi-stakeholder initiatives, there has to be some sort of system of accountability in place. Um, and the fact is that unfortunately, I think a lot of times civil society doesn't wanna lose their seat at the table. And I can understand why I've been in that position myself, but sometimes this leads to, I think, um, uh, civil society organizations not being willing to say, publicly um, what their experience has been in an initiative um, and feeling like, you know, these, these companies or these governments aren't gonna continue to talk to me if I complain too much, uh, really. Um, and I'm here to say that that is not really the case, uh, that most of the time you can say what you think, you're not gonna get uh, kicked out. Um, I've been very blunt about my, my opinions about these different initiatives over the years. And I'm gonna share a bunch of links um, the things that I've written over the years about some of these various initiatives. So um, I do think that on civil society side, we need to be willing to speak up publicly. Um, I think there's also value in some civil society organizations saying, no, we're not gonna participate in this and others uh, you know, being willing to do, uh, if they're sort of working in collaboration, I think we saw that with the independent advisory committee for, for GIVCT. Um, okay, so let me get to, I just wanna respond to some of these specific points and then talk a little bit about my um, experience. So just with the Christchurch call, uh, just to, to give a sense of the, the timeline, I do want to say that initially, um, the way that civil society got involved, uh, actually, was that a lot of us didn't know that this was happening and saw a leaked copy of the of the call. Uh, we were then really scrambled and I, incredible work, um, all of the civil society people on this call engaged in this process of bringing together people from around the world to comment on something and then actually creating a meaningful output <clears throat> from that. Um, but I think since then, a lot of the things that we brought up in that document have been addressed um, and, and we've, we've tried to work on addressing some of those points. Um, that being said, you know, uh, so it was over the summer that um, we, civil society engagement was actually much more formalized. However, that being said, I, I do need to point out that we did we participated in this September 2019 UN event. It was it was really an incredible opportunity 
However, um, as a member of civil society, bluntly, we were reminded constantly that it was a privilege for us to be there, that we should feel lucky to be at the UN, that it's not normal to have civil society speaking to members of the UN. Um, I don't think that's a good, you know, that's not a great starting point. Um, so really the initiative started with companies and governments. Um, so I think it was civil society that really made civil society engagement happen. Um, that being said, I think there's been uh, there's been real interest, particularly in the part of the New Zealand government, to try to make it sustainable. Um, and and the fact that we got funding for a secretariat, uh, I think, is 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 certainly um, really helpful. Um, so with with GIFCT, um, Aaron, you know, you said in your comments that at the beginning, um, at that time, civil society was mostly in a consultative role. I would say that civil society is absolutely still only in a consultative role, and frankly, oftentimes not even that. Um, so, you know, the uh, one of the the key recommendations in the GIFCT Human Rights Impact Assessment um, was uh, they, they did recognize a lack of accountability for GIFCT in the current structure. So, um, we we have seen now that um, GIFCT is going to institute a system of formal recommendations from the Independent Advisory Committee to the Operating Board um, and formal responses from the Operating Board to the uh, Independent Advisory Committee. So this is actually modeled on the Facebook Oversight Board, um, which I think is interesting as we're talking about all of the, the three here. Um, so this, this recommendation, I think, was strongly influenced by the Christchurch Call Advisory Network inputting into the Human Rights Impact Assessment. Um, GIFCT has said that in two years time, it will review the merits of transitioning to a multi-stakeholder board. Um, I would argue that you know, two years is too long, that the GIFCT is being shaped now um, and that uh, to move from sort of window dressing to uh, actual consultative role, I think that would, um, doing that earlier would make a big difference. Um, so uh, another point that Aaron made is you can't make the goal to agree. I absolutely agree with that. And I think that that needs to be a, a fundamental um, starting point for multi-stakeholder initiatives. Um, where I think that, that we can tease out that principle a little bit is how do you more clearly communicate where there is disagreement? I don't think there's a problem with disagreement. And I have to say um, in one of the working groups that I'm participating in now, um, we're talking about doing some research where the output is actually going to be to highlight all the areas of disagreement. I think that that is something useful and meaningful. Uh, I know it sounds like maybe a frustrating process, but uh, but I think that that's a that's a good starting point. Um, and I think GIFCT has also done a, a little bit of this with the human rights impact assessment. I really uh, I really think that that human rights impact assessment was very helpful. Um, so on the oversight board, um, something that really stuck out uh, that Rachel said is that Meta can't fire me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I say that because, you know, having a seat at the table uh, or having a role where you are protected, where you know that you can say something, you can say something meaningful. I mean, Meta also can't fire any of the members of the board. They can't say, oh, board, you were too mean to us. We didn't like that you called us out um, when, you know, we lied to you about cross-check. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, you know, I actually think I, I would really, and I've done this publicly, I would really urge members of the board um, to be comfortable to go even further than they have. Um, you know, I think, and actually, uh, I think this is, this is an, a, a, difficult, a difficult point to make, but I do think it's important. I think members of any advisory body, members of any board need to be willing to walk away at any point where they feel like there is not legitimacy anymore. Um, and, and I think this is, this is a, a frightening prospect. Again, you don't wanna lose your seat at the table. Um, and I don't and I don't say that the oversight board is there yet. I, I think uh, there's still a lot more to be learned from this experiment. Um, and and to be really blunt, um, <laughs> every one of my comments to on every case has has actually been integrated. And that is actually quite different um, from my experience with with GIFCT and with Christchurch call. Not every one of my recommendations has been implemented there. Uh, and in fact, sometimes, you know, I think there's this fundamental question of um, what, and I'm gonna wrap up shortly, um, but I think there's this fundamental question of what does civil society actually get consulted about? What should we be consulted about? Um, what does that look like? Uh, and unfortunately, I think this has been a major block in a lot of these discussions with the oversight board. It's very clear, um, the process is very clear. 
uh, even though it is more expansive in many ways than Gibbs CT and Christchurch Call, it's actually also more, much more limited. You're making decisions about a specific pieces of content from one company. Um, so it's been easier to see the impact of that. With Gibbs CT and Christchurch Call, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, what I want to see, and, and I think this is why the human rights impact assessment was interesting, because it was a real chance for civil society to input into something that was going to have a clear output that highlighted the areas of concern. Um, but again, that's not something that is binding. Um, so I think, uh, I think even on the consultation level, um, I think there's still a lot of questions about that. Uh, how does that happen in a meaningful way? More importantly, what does meaningful mean? Um, it should certainly include, at a minimum, really making clear what the civil society concerns are, but preferably actually responding to them. Um, I have to say another block in multi-stakeholder uh, discussions is concerns about sovereignty from governments that are participating. Um, I don't have an easy answer to this, but I just wanna throw it into the mix for the discussion. Um, and also we do oftentimes run into difficulties with unclear or non-existent answers about fundamental elements of business practices by corporations. And actually this is something that the Facebook Oversight Board also ran into. Hopefully is, that is not continuing, but I, you know, I think we all have our doubts. Um, so last thing I just want to touch on uh, is evening the playing field. Um, a few things that we have thought about in these initiatives uh, and, and that I think there's still work to be done on. Um, so one, of course, is information disparities. Uh, something that we've done in the Christchurch call is try to get more regular report backs. Um, I think the oversight board initially when you were putting the cases out there, there was difficulties with people feeling like they couldn't actually comment because they couldn't understand what the case was about. Um, and we've seen a lot of improvements there. Um, but uh, certainly information disparities, bringing civil society in early and into more conversations, um, having actual authority over decisions or at a minimum real accountability processes for decisions. Uh, so. Again, um, just mentioned that aspect of the, the independent advisory committee um, and sort of required responses. So really building that into the process so that you have regular information sharing, um, you have regular responses. Uh, I think all of these can help. And then finally, of course, funding. Um, I also wanna throw into the conversation um, for later, and this is the last thing I'm gonna say, um, how, what, are, what are the potential dangers in having funding for these, um, for these bodies, particularly if the funding is coming from companies? I think that in civil society, a lot of us have heard, oh, well, you, you, you took Facebook money, um, we don't trust you, you know? Um, and, and Facebook, I refuse to say meta. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, I think there's also difficulties there. How do you actually make the funding independent? Again, the oversight board is a very specific example, but it's a good example. It's an independent trust. Um, I would love to have an independent trust associated with GIFCT. Um, maybe, maybe we can convince you to do that. Um, so thank you so much. I know that was a lot. I'm gonna throw a bunch of links into the chat and really looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Great, thank you so much. And I just immediately go to Courtney. Uh, Courtney, um, Considering that every time uh, one, of, uh, one of these initiatives pop us out and they say, oh, we want to be a multi-stakeholder, how can we be multi-stakeholder? Uh, so um, tell us uh, a little bit about uh, what your perception is and what sort of principles you think we can like, apply broadly uh, to these um, organizations. Great. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. So just to do a little scene study and um, so that you know who I am if you're not familiar with these uh, initiatives and apologies in advance um, if the loudspeaker comes on here. But my name is Courtney Raj and I come at this both as a participant in all of the three processes that are laid out here as a civil society participant, but also as an academic. And I practice participant observation, which means that I take an ethnographic lens to the things that I participate in a part in a civil society way so that we can do this sort of in-depth analysis and really understand the struggles in this case over how do we define something as multi-stakeholders. And that's what I think is so interesting here because what we're trying to do with this framework is to create an analytical framework that can let us look at certain entities and processes to determine whether or not they are multi-stakeholder. But what we did 
really do here is to address the normative contestation over what gets to is multi-stakeholder. It comes from, for me uh, is whether a bilateral relationship, for example, uh, between when, when it is a private sector and a government initiative, can that be considered multi-stakeholder? There are um, scholars like Laura Denardis who I think would, would argue yes. Um, I am of the mind that multi requires more than two, that when we say bilateral, um, there are multi requires more than two stakeholders. So by definition, I would say that public private partnerships are not multi stakeholder. I also think that there is a normative value in, in the role that civil society plays um, in making something multi stakeholder, particularly and specifically in the internet governance realm. And so when we um, when we look at this, then we can say, okay, uh, this analytical framework is helpful because we can see where, um, as Milton laid out at the beginning, do those points of influence, consultation, et cetera, uh, arise. And those can be both, and I think we need to add another dimension, which is um, we can talk about the entity itself, or we can talk about specific processes. And I think that could be interesting as well, because you mentioned the Facebook oversight board. Um, the Facebook Oversight Board itself, I would argue, is not multi-stakeholder. However, the process by which it in, you know, works on content moderation issues with respect to Facebook seems to be somewhat multi-stakeholder. So I think that's another um, interesting dimension that we could tease out. Uh, similarly, there is a related process to the GIF CT and the Christchurch call, both of which have to do with the issue of countering violent extremism online. And that is the OECD, the Organization for Economic Security and, uh, sorry, uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the TVEC process, terrorism, violent extremism content process, which is using the OECD, which is a multilateral organization, but has formal multi-stakeholder entities to represent private sector and civil society in OECD decision-making and standard setting processes. So it's interesting to see in the TVEC process that despite this being a multilateral organization, they adopted multi-stakeholder processes in order to legitimize the standards that they're coming up with. And so all of the stakeholders had to come to consensus about these standards, which have just been um, adopted and I believe are going to be rolled out soon. So I think that's something, another dimension for us to, to think about. Um, Earlier, both you know, the speakers talked about impact oriented and, and the importance of impact, which of course uh, that is ideal. But I think that there is not necessarily anything inherent about the analytical framework that has to do with impact. So in fact, I think that what we see with multi-stakeholderism as an ism, as an ideology, is that a lot of it is about uh, practice. A lot of it is about being able to call something uh, call something multi-stakeholder in order to gain access to the normative symbolic power that that brings in the field of internet governance. Um, it's very difficult, I think, for the, for example, the Christchurch call, as you heard from Dia, faced a lot of um, uh, criticism from civil society early on because of the lack of incorporation of civil society into that process, into the drafting of the 12 principles, into uh, you know, the, the first conference, et cetera. And so you know, we've seen how what started as a bilateral uh, call, a bilateral kind of set of agreements between private companies and, uh, and governments has become more multi-stakeholder because of the normative uh, power that the field of internet governance holds to compel things to become multi-stakeholders. So I think that's very interesting for us to think about as well. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out with the GIF CT is um, I, I personally don't think it, it uh, qualifies as a multi-stakeholder initiative because of its um, governance model and the lack of any sort of formal consultative role, that is not, I am, I am involved in the GIF-CT. Um, so that's not to say that 
it doesn't, there are not ways for other stakeholders to be involved. Um, but what I think is interesting is that in the beginning, when the gift CT was being spun up, they did consultations um, with civil society, where I think they heard very strongly from many of those that they consulted with that they that we did not want the gift CT to be created because we were concerned about the precedence it would create for coordinating censorship and the removal of content across the internet. And while there may be very valid reasons to want to do that for terrorism, and I'll just remind you that the you know, first viral terrorist video was of a journalist named Jim Foley that really went um, online in 2014. And I've worked a lot with this family. So that, you know, this is, these are very real concerns. But I think a lot of the concerns we had was once you create the capacity to do something like that it could be it could be co-opted by governments or private sector and expanded and i've posted some links um, in the chat that kind of go through some of those concerns and we've seen that with the expansion to white nationalism and extremism which again has its pros and cons but what's interesting to go back to the framework is that civil society attempted to deny validation um, of the gift CT and deny its ability to claim multi-stakeholderism by not joining the International Advisory Committee. So you'll see that the members of the IAC do not include any of the organizations that have been working on the issue of con countering violent extremism going back to um, the ISIS and, and Syria and, and that whole um, initiative, you know, back in 2014, um, when the CVE online agenda became very prominent under the Obama administration and, and the UN initiatives. However, that failed because one of the interesting thing about these multi-stakeholder initiatives is um, businesses and governments have other fora where they can coordinate and they are more clearly identified as entities. It's much clear, it's much more clear to determine what is a government or not. That's a pretty given. Easier, maybe a little bit harder in some cases, private sector. Civil society, much more amorphous. Um, as was alluded to, you can't just go to one place to consult with civil society. We don't have other venues where we can necessarily come um, to agreements among ourselves that is are exclusive of other actors. And so I think that's an interesting dynamic as well um, to think about because you had other very excellent um, civil society members, particularly from academia, which is more of an, it's still part of civil society, but very individualistic in a way that a lot of civil society organizations are not. Um, so that failed. So then what happened is a lot of those of us who were interested in trying to kind of deny access to the norm of multi-stakeholderism saw the gift CT is going to be, is going to happen. It's existing. It's getting set up. So we better figure out how to get involved. So luckily there were the working groups and now we're all involved in that. And I think it's just an interesting way to see how, uh, you know, the power of different stakeholders trying to be exerted in different venues to um, gain access to that multi-stakeholder uh, normative symbolic power that holds and that contestation um, that happens. And what that means then, of course, for the types of work that gets done. Um, we also mentioned the, the issue of funding and monetary support and kind of alluded to the challenges and complexity of that. Because on the one hand, um, the funding of civil society participation or, or participation, say, of smaller companies by um, other entities or smaller governments that also lack capacity in some cases, you know, to engage in all these multitude of processes can lead to uh, concerns about co-optation. On the other hand, these entities that we're talking about here today represent the wealthiest entities in the world, trillion dollar companies that have now bonded together to create a new organization that, you know, if you look at the budgets of its founding members is probably more than the budget of um, the US and China combined, if I was going to guess. Um, don't quote me on that. But I think so I think that presents interesting dilemmas, because it's great to hear that um, the gift CT has recognized that it needs to fund research and the diversity of the research that's getting funded in this specific case. Um, nonetheless, the, the concern, I think, some, uh, of how what research gets funded and who 
we've seen that emerge from the tech sector quite significantly in the AI space. Um, I don't want to say, I, from what Aaron has said, we've seen a lot of different types of research um, being done, but let's also think about um, the types of multi-stakeholder entities that these um, different stakeholders spin up and then you know, give these organizational lives to have implications for the type of research that gets done. What are we going to look at as problems or solutions and how do we look at that? And another aspect, which is this tension in, in the internet governance field, especially between multi-stakeholderism as a normative value and as one of the ways that you can gain legitimacy in the space and the very limited resources that civil society and other um, stakeholders have to engage in the proliferation of multi-stakeholder initiatives. So what I'm interested to see is, because I, I kind of feel like we're reaching a little bit of an inflection point, at least in the space of internet governance and content moderation, is what happens when, um, when you just don't have the capacity to engage in any other multi-stakeholder initiatives. What does that mean? Um, and what does that do then to the model and the analysis that we're presenting here? So in a nutshell, I would say that is, uh, you know, those are some thoughts on how we apply the analytical framework to internet governance and specifically these initiatives. And I think that this is a very promising way um, for us to think about some of the principles therefore that we need to have um, at the root of multi-stakeholderism. And I think the next step that we're going to take is um, you know, some sort of roadshow to these very initiatives um, and all others to put together a set of principles that will codify some of these. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. So uh, uh, let's go to the audience and see if they have actually any kind of comments? Um, uh, if not, I'm just going to pose some uh, questions. Uh, so, so the uh, as I said in the beginning, the we um, we are aiming for this session to be the start of a dialogue on uh, multi, what is multi stakeholder and uh, and uh, where where we can find it and so that we can also like provide some solutions or principles for um, those uh, entities that want to start a multi stakeholder uh, process uh, to uh, refer to because as uh, we saw um, uh, in the beginning a, lo a lot of these initiatives, uh, they were surprised that civil society was so riled up about like not being included and they didn't even think that um, uh, that, th that there is like this uh, bunch of groups that have been working on these issues and have an interest at stake. So, and what are the issues? So the principles I think they should address uh, first of all, uh, where do we where do we uh, use this multi stakeholder uh, process? Uh, uh, would it be like about the, when uh, matters can actually uh, affect the global internet, and uh, and also like what are what are the other broad uh, principles and uh, solutions that uh, governments or corporations or civil society, when they want to like start an initiative and call it multi-stakeholder, they, they need to consider. And also like there is another question about the authority of uh, civil society, which I think uh, we need to pay attention to and uh, kind of like shape our uh, role in the multi-stakeholder uh, model and uh, request uh, uh, from those who actually start these processes to have a specific role. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, I'm just gonna open the uh, floor uh, and uh, ask, um, uh, any uh, uh, one of you, if you if you want to like uh, weigh in on, should we have principles for multi stakeholder uh, models? How can we uh, encourage uh, those who want to like start such processes to actually use them and implement them? And go ahead, Milton. Yes, um, there are thousands of teaming civil society members here. Um, clamoring for a voice and uh, I fought my way to the front. Uh, uh, but um, I did wanna say that 
when we talk about uh, principles of multi-stakeholderism, um, I wanted to provide, uh, and Jyoti and I with this paper, we wanted to provide a framework for assessing it. And uh, I think it would be a bit of a mistake to make it too normative in the sense that there is one particular model of uh, multi-stakeholder governance that um, is the right one. Uh, it really will depend on the sector, uh, the type of policy decisions that's being made and the structure of the organizations that are involved. So just the distinction between Facebook, you know, uh, they've got enormous pressure on them uh, to legitimize their content moderation decisions and they're using uh, this sort of broadening of the authority uh, to a quasi civil society organization to to uh, reduce that pressure in a way that I think is is interesting and uh, justifiable, but uh, it would hard to think of that being a model for any other uh, or all other situations right so that's just uh, uh, one bit of warning. Erin, go ahead. Oh, okay. I can't, if you nod virtually, I, I don't know who you're nodding to. Um, sorry. No, I only, I only. Oh, okay. Uh, it's so hard virtually these days. No, I mean, there's a lot to pick up on there and we could probably write a few PhDs or books on everything brought up in this discussion. I think for, for us recognizing we're this kind of unique NGO now, we have to just go back to what our core purpose is. Our core mission statement is to prevent terrorist and violent extremist exploitation across digital platforms. And so when you look at uh, these different forums, as just mentioned, they have different stakeholders at their core and then are bringing in other stakeholders in these different capacities to get to a better place. But one thing we have to constantly do is say, okay, if this isn't gonna get tech to a better place, that's scope creep. If this goes into other harms areas that really aren't related to terrorism and violent extremism, that's gonna be scope creep. Um, and it's really hard to kind of say, all right, well, what's our added value and what can we do? And to Courtney's point, while at the same time, some people said, we don't want this to be an initiative. There were also huge pushes from different bodies to say, we don't want this to be run by Facebook, Microsoft, YouTube, and Twitter. We want an independent body in fact, other tech companies wanting to join into the space didn't want it run by just a couple big companies. Part of the reason the independence came about was also to allow us to have a bigger tent approach. Also, when you're a 501c3, your finances start becoming very transparent. Uh, they are now queryable. That will come out shortly. We're now finishing up our first year as an NGO. So it almost forces areas of transparency that might make some of our founding fathers uncomfortable in the long run, because it will show what money's going where for what a little bit more. Um, so the push and pull again, it's not to say, well, multi-stakeholderism failed because your perspective wasn't 100%. I think actually what multi-stakeholderism teaches us is that nobody will get 100% of what they want, but at least you're all moving forward with some concerns either at the forefront implemented or in some of your long-term development strategy plans. So doing a human rights impact assessment, we then had to release a letter saying, okay, what if this is a short-term thing that we can get to? Again, little things that are big things to some people, like our transparency report doubled in size because of the working group, because of the human rights impact assessment. That's not gonna get all the data points out there, but it's gonna get us on the roadmap to get even better next year, even better next year. And I, I also think multi-stakeholderism, it always feels a bit, it feels a bit like self-harm sometimes because there is no way that any day everyone on this call is going to wake up and go, you know what, GCT, you nailed it. You're done the way you counter terrorism. We're all happy with it. It's, it's actually constantly holding yourself up to harder homework. It's like, and that is, again, it's a good thing in the long run. It makes it a little hard to force that as part of your process because authoritarian dictatorships are easier when you're like, actually, we're just going to do it based on this one group and what they like to do, that can get you short-term fast wins and it eventually will be the downfall of you. So I think, you know, it's, these are the harder forms to come to for myself and maybe some others on the call because you're, you're kind of being like, okay, where are we still not 100% there? You know, as an NGO, we've been running only a year and a half uh, and we're trying to put all the building blocks in place to make it more sustainable and make sure some of these fears are at the forefront of our work. 
but it also is it's knowing that this is the right thing to do and it's better to hear the people that disagree with you the most sometimes than putting yourself in your own echo chamber where it feels really comfortable uh yeah so uh, this is this is important to um well uh, sometimes uh, initiatives and processes, they think that if they just like open the door to uh, comments and criticism, that is a multi-stakeholder process. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, this, uh, this kind of like uh, listen, listening to comments, but then also like when the implementation doesn't uh, really happen or when you don't uh, take in uh, feedback uh, uh, systematically, then and I'm not talking about give city here. I'm, I'm saying that like in broader uh, claims that uh, sometimes multilateral organization have that, oh yes, we are multi-stakeholder. Uh, it's just that you don't have a vote. Um, uh, so uh, th this kind of like, we, we need to be able to also with this framework to identify those kind of uh, claims and uh, not to, not to uh, consider everything multi-stakeholder if there is like there are ways to actually weigh in for other uh, stakeholders in the process. Okay, Courtney, you have your hand up. I also see a pushback against um, uh, against principles in chat, like coming up with principles. I actually uh, I'm uh, neutral about that. I just want to. Uh, uh, kind of like set the um, scene for our next steps. What what should we do about this? Should we just like have a session and congratulate each other, and uh, or should we uh, work on this frame uh, draft framework and uh, work on like other issues? Uh, go ahead, Court. Great, thanks so much. Yeah, and and I you know for for me you know coming here this is uh, an an academic exercise to come up with a I mean it's an academic exercise but also a meaningful exercise with the idea that we can come up with some factors to allow us to also help entities that want to do multi-stakeholder uh ism better uh or to you know have new initiatives to understand what does that look like and and how does that look like in different ways because the, precisely to the fact that there is not one model as as Milton pointed out and that the you know the the kind of qualitative assessments here and the 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 considerations about power dynamics is not to say that that delegitimizes a multi-stakeholder initiative I think it underscores the challenge of doing multi-stakeholder um, initiatives in internet governance I mean it, it is not necessary that the companies ever consult with civil society it is not required um, that governments that are not democratic uh, consult with civil society there are different imperatives and I think it's interesting nonetheless that you do have um, some companies and some governments doing that so I think you know the point of this is to create in my point of view an anal an analytical framework that could give rise to a set of principles. And we know that the Santa Clara principles have just been um, updated the launch and I'm putting in the chat what is um, in the Net Mundial um, statement about multi-stakeholder uh, principle. But personally, I don't think that definition of multi-stakeholder is enough because again, to the point that we've just spent the past hour going through, you know, there are, it, what does meaningful and accountable participation actually mean? And that's why I'm really excited by this framework that we put together because I think it really helps us think through that and then therefore get to the sense, you know, this is a kind of high level principle, but I guess what we're thinking the next steps could be is a more operational set of principles. Thanks. Thank you. So we have, uh, yes, uh, exactly, the operational uh, principles that um, we can also uh, uh, give, uh, that they can actually be implemented and uh, improve the processes and we can actually measure uh, how much the processes have improved. Uh, so we have five more minutes and apparently there is a, a top-down rule that we have to be very punctual. Uh, so um, I'm just gonna, I don't see many comments in the, in chat. Uh, if you have any last words on the, on our next steps, uh, our panelists or uh, in chat, uh, then um, let's, let's just take a round and, um, uh, 
and uh, talk about the next step and finalize it. Okay, uh, Dia, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Oh, I, I mean, honestly, Courtney, um, Courtney said everything that I that I wanted to say. I, I think that, um, I guess just my last point, I think that principles like this can help civil society, um, even if for nothing else, they can help civil society judge whether a process is something that's worth us participating in. Um, because I, I, as I said, I've been involved in every one of these. There are weeks where 40 to 50% of my time is taken up with multi-stakeholder work. Um, again, particularly with these three initiatives. And so I think that we need to have a way of deciding um, where to allocate our time. And certainly I, I would look at this as a starting point for assessing that. Great, thank you. So Ellen, as the, um, you're a part of the uh, government now and working on Christchurch Call, where do you want to uh, see this uh, initiative of ours go? How can it help you? Um, I mean, I think there's been a lot of really useful food for thought around the different aspects. So what, the thing that's kind of resonating in my mind going forward is, you know, we have these criteria, but the why are we working together in multi-stakeholderism um, is something I've heard some really different views here, right? So like we think about it and I think it's important to reflect some people do it because it's a normative process, because it gets you cut off. Others see it as something you have to do to battle your enemies you know, in a way that, um, you know, better now than later and them sneaking up on you. Um, but I think that, you know, my experience with the Christchurch call early on and what I hope for its future is actually about a better outcome on the work that the people who got involved got involved because they were experts, because they cared about the topic and the impact it would have. And they really believed that a better outcome would be brought through, you know, engagement of the different views and that's why I brought up that term influence to actually understand each other's perspectives and come out with a way forward that is a better way forward. And it isn't trying to win and get your way. It's trying to understand others' perspectives and find a better way forward to deal with what you have in front of you, which is a complex, you know, internet and complex problem. So that's my hope. And, and it's something I've seen in action amongst some of the people that are here now. Yeah. Great, thank you. And Erin, uh, one minute, we have one. I feel like I interjected more than others because once we get started, it's hard to shut me up. So I'll, I'll keep it brief. I just think, again, I think multi-stakeholderism, when you bring other people to the table, it has to be output and impact oriented. Uh, we've, we've tried to do that. I think it can always get better. And I think to Dia's point, we've also tried in this evolving space to make sure that when people participate, one, if they miss a session of something, they're not penalized for it because people are on different time zones. I can tell you having working groups with 35 country participants is like a five, five dimensional Rubik's cube. And we're all, we're switching back and forth between times to make sure nobody feels overly burdened at least half the time. And, but also implementing ways that people can communicate that aren't forcing them to be in time and space meetings. So trying to put in things like joint notes where people can follow up and see from last time's notes if they missed it or Slack channels. There's no perfect way, but we're trying to put in just sideways ways of communicating and working together that don't force time zone compliance or physical time in your day. Uh, and that's, a, I think that's a work in process. And there's some things being developed in the last two years that help with that, but that's the best way so that, again, that time burden, especially on CSOs, how can we alleviate that? And I think that's where more guidance will be needed in the future as well, to make sure it's not physically demanding, especially if you're involved in more than one initiative. Great, thank you. So uh, from uh, uh, what I can see from the discussion, we need, we need to, it's, it seems like we've been talking about multi-stakeholder principle for a long time. We need to like pass that and go to the operational uh, principles and uh, come up with like something more concrete and implementable. So I, uh, we are going to publish the uh, draft framework uh, soon and uh, we will uh, distribute it and uh, you can comment on it. And um, uh, Milton, any last words? I would just say that um... Uh, I liked Ellen's question about why, why are we doing this? Why are we concerned about multi-stakeholderism at all? And um, I think the key answer to that is that, you know, when we had the internet kind of grow unexpectedly, we created a, a non-jurisdictional space 
and we've been struggling with the problem of global versus uh, global governance because many democracies have you know multi-stakeholder processes or representational processes for doing government but the problem is the the internet is not bounded by these national borders so one of the key rationales for multi-stakeholderism in internet governance is the fact that you can be transnational people can be represented uh, not by their government as if they're everybody in a you know, 80 million person society has the same view, but they can be represent themselves and they can have in effect uh, new forms of uh, institutions that can engage in self governance or, or as I like to put it, uh, popular sovereignty. Great. And uh, we are violating the top down rule of uh, ending this punctually. I want to thank uh, the panelists and also the participants. And uh, thank you so much. And you will hear uh, from us uh, soon with the framework. And um, uh, thank you again.